Good afternoon and welcome to Calcium Masterclass 7, Bifurcations Focus on Best Practices. Our show is brought to you by Shockwave and Optima Education. And today we'll be looking at some of the underlying principles of bifurcations and coronary arterial calcium. I'd like to introduce my co-chair and close friend, Colm Hanratty, consultant cardiologist from the Matter Hospital in Dublin. It's also a real pleasure to introduce Thierry Lefebvre, who's joining us virtually from Paris for this exciting live case broadcast from the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati with Robert Riley and James Kong. And following that, Thierry will be talking us through his presentation on what is optimal bifurcation treatment in calcific coronary disease. But before then, Cullum's here to start proceedings with his talk on bifurcations and coronary arterial calcium underlying principles. Over to you, Cullum. Thanks, James. I'm going to talk today about bifurcations and some underlying principles. You're well aware that the need for calcium modification is likely to continue to grow in the future. You're also aware that in the presence of calcification, coronary interventions do less well, and you get much greater target vessel failure in the presence of moderate to severe calcification. These would be the fundamentals of stent implantation in a non-bifurcation scenario. So now I'm going to talk to you about some additional considerations that you would take into account when managing a bifurcation lesion. You have the size of the side branch, the relevance of the side branch, the burden and the distribution of the disease, and actually the angle at that bifurcation all come into play and will affect your decision making as you proceed. The pathology is quite interesting in how disease forms at bifurcation and that turbulence and shear forces increases the likelihood of developing obstructive disease at bifurcations. There are many different classifications, but the Medina classification is the one we would use most commonly to describe the presence or absence of the disease at each of the three limbs of the bifurcation, the proximal main branch, the distal main branch, and the side branch. In terms of uh, increased complexity, and I think we would all agree that treating a bifurcation leads in a more complex uh, lesion subset. Obviously, there's patient factors that come into play. The anatomy, we, we mentioned there may be vessel uh, size mismatch. Then you've got uh, safety considerations where these will be longer procedures. You're more likely to get ischemia in either the main branch or the side branch. The risk of dissection and perforation come into play. Uh, and that's before we look specifically at the role of calcification. So they are a more complex uh, uh, subset. Uh, and this graphic shows what can happen when you place a balloon or a stent in the main vessel, you get plaque shift or crinal shift into the side branch. And I know that Thierry will deal on this with a lot more detail during his talk. We know that when uh, bifurcation lesions are treated, patients do less well. So this uh, is part of the Syntax study, and it showed that the presence of a bifurcation was a major contributor to a higher residual Syntax score and increased target vessel failure. Uh, another slide from the same study showing that bifurcations were more likely to be associated with an incomplete revascularization, and we know that an incomplete revascularization, patients do less well in the longer term. And so all this information is suggesting that bifurcations are a more complex scenario. These are all the various bifurcation techniques that you can use. And this slide, of course, shows us that there's uh, far too many techniques. So there's no one clear technique for all scenarios. Um, in fact, there's far too many techniques. And one of the things I'm going to try and do is to distill down the different techniques into a more simple um, approach. So I think really there are four techniques in terms of broad techniques. The first would be a provisional technique. So this would be a single stent technique in the main vessel. And it would be best suited when the side branch is free of disease, or for example, if it's non-viable, then a single stent across that bifurcation is unlikely to result in harm. If there was a compromise off that side branch, you could switch to a TM protrusion as a bailout strategy but this would be a single stand strategy in about 85% of cases. 
With regards to the two stent uh, bifurcations, and there will be some scenarios where you uh, require to put in two stents from the outset. So the double kiss or the DK crush technique has gained a lot of popularity recently. So if you went to China, this would be the main two stent technique used. Personally, I think it's best suited when you've got a big mismatch between the side branch and the main vents branch. So let's say for example, the side branch is 2.5 millimeters, so you're not going to ignore it. Uh, but the main vessel is 4.5. So having a 2.5 millimeter stent coming back into a 4.5 millimeter vessel is probably not ideal. Whereas a 2.5 stent in the ostium of the side branch is probably a better uh, scenario. And um, I think that this is a good technique in this scenario where you cannot uh, give up one of your wires at any time during the case and a lot of operators this would be their preferred uh, method of treating uh, a bifurcation. This uh, schematic or bench test shows you how to go about uh, doing a DK crush. That's the first stent going into the side branch and then a balloon in the main vessel crushes the ostium of the side branch stent. And what is apparent with that, then is followed by the first kiss, is that the deformation of the stent is less than you think. And the stents do not deform in a pancake, but more in an ovoid type of scenario. This is then recrossing uh, and uh, optimizing the stent with a further second kissing inflation and further proximal optimization. So as I said, this is a very good case when you've got a big mismatch. We don't want to give up the wire in the side branch and you will ensure the ostium of the side branch is preserved before putting in the main vessel stent. One of the downsides with this technique, in my opinion, is as I mentioned, stents do not deform in a pancake fashion, but more in an ovoid. And if you look at the carina, you'll see quite a lot of metal on the uh, uh, luminal, abluminal side of the stent. So there is quite a lot of metal at the carina, and that can make recrossing, for example, a bit more unpredictable. Um, but still a very, very good technique, and you certainly should be familiar with how to perform it. Collot technique would be my preferred technique for a two-stand bifurcation, and certainly where both branches are similarly sized and no significant mismatch, um, where you've got a favorable or acute angle, then I think the culotte is a very predictable uh, technique. So what we do is we deploy a stent from the side branch back into the main branch. You then perform proximal optimization of that stent, matching it to the size of the proximal vessel. You recross into the main branch, deploy your second stent, perform further proximal optimization. You then recross into the side branch and perform your kissing inflation. And this, in my opinion, is a much more predictable way to treat or to, uh, to use a two-stent strategy for the bifurcation. And what you will see on the CT scanning is that while there are two layers in the proximal vessel, there's actually much less metal at the crown, and you don't get those big bulges of metal that you see with a DK crush technique. Uh, this is a study performed locally in, in the UK with um, the Celtic Bifurcation Study, which showed a procedural mace with culottes standing in about 200 patients of about 59 to 12%, 7.3 at 24 months, and most of these were actually procedurally related and i.e. not clinically relevant, with a target vessel failure of 2% at 24 months with culotte technique uh, performed uh, as you saw. Now let's then consider the impact of calcium. So up until now we've talked about methods of treating bifurcation. So what additional impact will the calcium have? And you'll have seen this pragmatic predilation uh, algorithm before, where if the lesion is compliant and the balloon gives, you can go ahead and deploy your stent. If, however, you have an undilatable lesion, a non-compliant lesion, um, if you go with a higher balloon inflation or an NC balloon and the lesion gives, you can proceed to stenting. But if you have a non-compliant lesion and you've got a bifurcation, the algorithm would say that you image both branches and you proceed to calcium modification. However, because you're dealing with a bifurcation, uh, you would not want to be giving up one of the wires to those side branches, so that automatically rules out rotational atherectomy and elliptical atherectomy for a lot of scenarios. 
Yes, it can be done, but as I mentioned, there's a downside to giving up the wire. And so in terms of calcium modification, you're moving then towards use of cutting balloon or scoring balloon or lithotripsy. And this schematic shows the penalty of um, giving up a side branch wire, that um, if you have shockwave, you would not have to give that up. And in that situation, the use of shockwave allows you to modify the calcium in the main vessel or the side branch, maintaining a wire in both branches and therefore increasing your procedural safety. So I'm just going to show you a few examples of stent failure where a patient underwent a two-stent bifurcation but without modification of the calcium in advance. So this lady had an intervention to the circumflex in 2013, came back with osteo-LED disease, which is probably proximal restenosis or injury at the time of the circumflex, presented this year with exertional angina and has MRI ischemia in the lateral and the apical territories. And this is the setup shot, an angiogram, seven French system. And angiographically, this does not look very um, exciting or, in fact, uh, complex. Uh, and this highlights the uh, deficiencies in uh, angiography for telling you what's going on inside the vessel. So there's a stent in the circumflex, there's a stent in the left anterior descending artery, and this goes back into the left main stem. First thing you do with any stent failure is to image. And the ibis from the left anterior descending artery back into the left main shows that the stent in the LED is actually well sized and well opposed. As you come into the left main stem, you can see that the stent is actually uh, floating in the left main stem and not opposed. And then there's a crushed stent down at six o'clock in the left main stem, which is probably part of the stent from the circumflex. When we image from the circumflex artery back into the left main, if you look at the long view, you'll get an idea of calcification and disruption at the ostium the circumflex, and that is certainly not visible on the angiogram. The circumflex stent is actually well uh, deployed and um, well expanded. The stent in the left main stem, you can see struts from nine o'clock round to three o'clock, but then a gap down around six o'clock. And the area of interest is the ostium of the circumflex, and I think you can appreciate the deep calcium beyond the stent. We had to predilate the struts to get the imaging catheter in, and, and the diameter of the struts are two millimeters at the ostium of the circumflex. So basically there was a failure to modify calcium at the time of the index procedure, implantation of a stent. There was post dilation of the stent and you could see good stent apposition uh, and expansion in the circumflex, but where you had this calcification and a failure to modify it, you have an underexpanded stent, which ultimately led to, led to stent failure for this patient. Here's another example, a slightly uh, more sorry case where a 46-year-old gentleman underwent intervention to the LAD circumflex with culotte stenting. He developed stent failure and was sent for surgery. He had a return of angina and came back. The lemur was patent to the LAD, but the graft onto the circumflex uh, was occluded and he was sent down to myself for a CTO PCI to the stent in the circumflex. Again, the setup shots show that the stents from the left main into the LAD are patent but there is occlusion of the stent in the circumflex and at the ostium. You can see the filling of the circumflex from an epicardial collateral. Opening it was quite easy, and then the imaging was quite illustrative. And what it showed was that the distal end of the stent, the stent was actually well-sized, well-expanded, with no significant restenosis. As you came more proximal, the stent was well-sized and again, uh, well-opposed. If you look at the top left and the left main stem, again, the stent was well-sized and well-opposed. It's worth mentioning this was a non-image guided case. However, in the two pictures around 12 o'clock, the osteal circumflex and the proximal circumflex, you'll see at the osteal circumflex, deep calcification uh, and block out of the um, uh, ultrasound and then the nodule of calcium on the screen to the right. So in a lot of areas, the stent was actually well-sized and well-opposed, but in the ostium of the circumflex and the proximal circumflex, the failure to modify the calcium before implanting the stent has led to stent failure for this gentleman. That stent failure led to a bypass operation and a common reason why people are sent for cardiac surgery is stent failure. 
And when you look at it with intravascular imaging, it's very common to find a mechanical reason for stents to fail in, in 2021. So this gentleman had calcification, which was not modified, and then stent implantation. So in summary, what I hope I've shown is that bifurcation lesions bring with it additional procedural complexity. It's important to identify and manage that calcification early in the process. And the aim of that is really to, number one, increase the patient safety during the, the period of the intervention, and then ultimately to uh, improve stent durability. Thank you for your time. So that was great, Colm. I mean, when I hear talks like that, I start to appreciate actually bifurcations are quite complex lesions. Uh, and you, perhaps you don't think of things like that when you look at things from an angiographic perspective only. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you're right. I think we do it subconsciously, but it's not algorithmic enough, you know, and it's not routine enough, and there's too many. Um, and of course, if it goes well, that's great, but whenever a case becomes more complex, that's whenever you start to make mistakes if you're not an algorithmic thinker. Um, so we need to break the bifurcation techniques down into very teachable, methodical steps, and, and then try and ensure that people follow them to the best of their ability. No. Adding calcium to a lesion never makes things easier, for sure. But does it make bifurcations especially more difficult? And if so, how does that work? Yeah, well, you've got, you've got two vessels, you've got two lesions. So, you know, if you, if you get into a problem with calcification in, in, in a straight segment, we know that's, that can be a world of pain. If you throw into the mix that you've got another branch, which is supplying a reasonable amount of myocardium, then you've got two areas that, that are uh, in jeopardy. So uh, absolutely. And then um, what I tried to show is that there's a lot of steps involved in treating a bifurcation, mm -hmm. a simple bifurcation well. Yeah. Um, so you, you can get into a world of pain, I think, if you don't modify calcium up front in a bifurcation. And certainly by the time you saw from the, the stent failure cases, once you've put a stent in and find calcified and undilatable lesion, we, you know, that's not a good scenario to be in. No, you're on your back foot there. So, so listen, sometimes with the best will in the world, in these calcific vessels, we know they're less compliant. It can be difficult to get imaging casters down there. And sometimes you kind of say, well, I've tried OCT, I've tried IVUS, you know, I should get a pass for that. Let's just go ahead and treat the case. What do you think about that? Yeah, and we're not going to convince everybody that they should use imaging in these cases, but uh, you know, my use of imaging and your use of imaging has switched to procedural planning. Um, so the fact that you have to modify a lesion to get the imaging catheter in doesn't mean to say you shouldn't image. And in fact, I think that's the opposite. That's more of a reason to use imaging. Um, you've seen the different techniques and all the different techniques. It, it's so confusing that you need to understand what is the size of the side branch, how much if areas it's obtending, what is the size of the distal main vessel, and what is the size of the proximal main vessel, the pattern of the calcification, the extent of the calcification. You have to understand that if mm -hmm. you're going to treat a bifurcation correctly. So your view would be, just to labour on that point, that if you can't deliver an imaging caster for whatever reason to start with, that subsequent to a balloon passage or a rotational atherectomy or whatever it was, you would still go back and get the information you need. It's that critical. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you, and you've, you've opened the catheter, so you've taken the, the hit in terms of the cost. There's no point in opening it and then not availing of the information. Um, if the catheter won't go, if the imaging catheter won't go, that's probably pushing you towards the equipment won't go road ablation end of the algorithm uh, rather than trying to bully in balloons. So a uh, lower threshold for use rotational atherectomy and then absolutely you've got to do the imaging to show that you have modified the calcium before proceeding. So that was great, Colm. I mean, there's a lot in there to digest. There's a lot in there to think about and hopefully we'll get some opportunity to reflect on some of those points and maybe bring some of those out in the live case. As you know, we're going to go and see Robert Riley and James Kong in Cincinnati. So let's see if we can kind of hold them to account with all those great lessons you've taught us. Good. Thanks, James. So it's a real pleasure to introduce our live case from Cincinnati with uh, James Kong and Robert Riley. Over to Robert and James. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much again for joining us. 
Uh, I'm Robert Riley with my partner here, James Kong. We've got Morning. fantastic room here today. We've got Ben, Doug, and Brian, Stephanie, our fantastic Cath Lab crew, along with a litany of uh, industry uh, partners here uh, with us as well to help us bumble through this case, Floro. Um, so what we've got here is a 68-year-old gentleman with typical CAD risk factors. At the end of last year, Ooh. All right, go ahead and go on up here. End of last year, ended up having about three months of classic CHF symptoms going up to about 10 there. Give it a little squeeze. Um, go ahead and come on down. I'm afraid we're going to have to drill this anyway. So um, ended up getting fluoro, a uh, echocardiogram. EF's about 20 to 25%. No major valvular disease. It's tight as a drum there, huh? All right, go ahead and go on up there, please. And um, so... Uh, EF 20 to 25% and down. Ended up getting sent for a coronary angiogram. Angiogram showed um, that he's got intermediate FFR negative disease in the dominant RCA, mild disease in the left main and circ, and then this very, very tight prox LED diag lesion. Um, ended up stopping at diagnostic angiography uh, just because we didn't know what was viable and what wasn't. Uh, ended up getting a nice PET. Everything was viable. Unfortunately, I got an optimal medical therapy through that and continued to have NYHA class 3 dyspnea and angina despite being on proper meds. Um, right heart cath at the time showed that he was euvolemic with a reasonable cardiac index. So based on that, we decided I'll go ahead and take OCT. Um, based on that, what's that? Yeah, so the, show the setup. Show yeah, the setup so based on that, ended up getting referred for this uh, Prox LED diagonal branch uh, PCI. And here's the setup shots. So here's an AP crane. You can see this just, mm. <laughs> just fun zone right there in the Prox LED. Mm -hmm. Here's a spider just to show the sort of landing zone, show all the diags that are involved. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we had, went ahead and wired both. Uh, we just got a workhorse wire in the LED and in that big diagonal branch, we don't think this this proximal branch will come into play, although it'll be something that we'll just have to think of. It doesn't look like there's a lot of disease there. We think probably that D2 has got a lot more involvement in terms of potential for coronal shift. Um, we've taken some small balloons down just to give the, the branch a squeeze before we OCT, just to ensure uh, that we're gonna get good uh, contrast down the vessel when we image. So, And then we're gonna kind of go from there. Brilliant. So, so Robert, we're very pleased to have Colm Hanratty, who you know well, and Thierry Lefebvre, uh, both as our expert panelists today. Mm -hmm. So if I could maybe go to Thierry, first of all, you're joining us virtually, Thierry. Here. We're also going to hear from you a bit later as well, which I'm looking forward to. Robert's showing a pretty hardcore case here. What are your initial thoughts mm -hmm. on, on strategy? Mm -mm. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting case because uh, the lesion looks relatively simple, but there is a high, oh, I see. high uh, level of calcification at this level. So I really think uh, that uh, a good preparation is really needed in this case. Oh, of course, of uh, OCT can be also a good way to evaluate uh, this lesion. All right. But I'm sure that you will need special things to prepare this lesion in order to have a good... Uh, Good result at the end. You can see that um, the equipment is not going easily, so no. the imaging equipment is not going. So that's telling us. You can see visible calcification. We know it's not a very sensitive way yeah. of assessing calcification, but if you see it, you know it's there. And then the equipment's not going into the main uh, LAD, so that tells us there's a significant block of calcium yeah. at that bifurcation. Thanks, it's definitely going to need calcium modification. And I think our algorithmic thinking would be pushing you towards road ablation up front if equipment won't go. Yeah. Um, we can't get the imaging catheter down. It needs to be modified and probably straight to road ablation at this stage, I would think. Yeah, Mike, uh, just keep the, the image and your image on screen for us as well, please. But I, I think uh, you, what is notable here is that this is a very focal lesion. And, uh, but there's also the combination of tortuosity. There's, a, there's actually quite a decent bend in that LED, which I think is really adding to the complexity of the lesion. So, so Robert, the, the team here is thinking about that you might need to do some sort of rotational atherectomy before you, you think about anything else if you can't get balloons passed. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so we've already got, you know, Get where? Flora. We've got a trapper in uh, to trap that workhorse wire down. We've got our Corsair Pro XS135 microcatheter actually coming down here. You can see it, it was not super thrilled. It's going to require a bit of spinning to get down, which tells you again something else for those of you that use microcatheters routinely. 
So that was a bit of a bollocks there. So now I'm going to use fun words today. All right. You so know now on camera. We're... <laughs> oh, I don't know what some of these mean. All right. Anyway, so uh, we're going to use uh, the uh, the roto uh, the new roto wire here. This is the roto drive wire designed by Asahi for Boston Scientific. Great. A little bit more deliverable, which uh, I'm going to be honest, I use microcatheters to deliver most of my, most of my roto wires anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But let's just we, pretend it's more deliverable. Again, please, Robert, just Absolutely. to remind ourselves. Yeah. That epicranial. Yeah. There is that little bend column just past yeah. the diagonal, I think, that's causing a lot and of And that's what everything's been, and that's what everything's been hanging up on. You saw mm -hmm. the OCT catheter. So that's actually the second time I've tried to deliver it. Um, I used a 2.0 to cure you which is our lowest profile balloons here in the US market, realistically, um, the most deliverable balloons that we have. Um, and a 2.0 actually went quite well. Uh, and then I tried, I just squeezed it up to, you know, 10 or 12, and then fluoro, and then tried to deliver the OCT off, off camera before we went live and it wouldn't go. So since we weren't live yet, I thought I'd do a little cheating and uh, try a 2.5 to carry you. Uh, and uh, 2.5 went, actually, uh, took it up to 10 or 12. And um, still, the OCT wouldn't go. So I think we've we've given this thing a pretty fair shot. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, you know not uh, of whether we need to uh, do any formal atherectomy or not. Okay. And you've still got your wire in place there, Robert, as well. Yeah, we're going to take that wire out of the diag here in a second as soon as we get the burr ready. I think I'll, I'll come and up that's in the end discussion. one of the disadvantages, obviously, of rotational versus shockwave. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll make up in, I, I in think the talks. It's, uh, that the fact that you have uh, you have to re remove the wire in the diagonal branch is not an issue because the risk of losing the diagonal is very slow, very low. Uh, yeah, but that's coming from the person who said this was an easy case, so I have some concerns about you know in terms of my flare. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, even after rotablation, you will right. be uh, uh, it will be uh, easier to access the side branch because you remove uh, a lot of plaque uh, by using uh, rotablation. So I think no. the, the combination of uh, pre preparation with rotablation and then uh, shockwave can be a very good uh, combination in this particular case where yeah. there is a big uh, piece of calcium uh, at the level of this lesion. You know, I will say this, you know, that was the traditional teaching over years. It's not supposed to be plaque shift and all this. Having done hundreds a year of rotational atherectomy, Fleur here, having to, for better or worse, do hundreds of cases of atherectomy a year, it's not unfortunately always that simple. Yeah, and I think we, if we can, uh, we, we moved away from rotational atherectomy for bifurcations we'll for that reason that you can keep a wire in the side branch at all times. And uh, while well, Terry's point is very well made that the chance of plaque shift is less and you are debulking, yeah. yeah. there is still a slight risk. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I, from my own practice, I think where there's a bifurcation at a large branch that you don't want to give up that wire there probably is a preference towards using a shockwave in that scenario. Yeah, I think yeah. that's true, Colin, but I think the other thing that we're seeing is that the, we're integrating technologies. We're not you know, using one to exclusion no. of the other. And exactly. this, is a, this is a good example here where we've done this algorithm approach. Robert's escalated it with balloons. He still can't get an imaging caster passed. And you, you would imagine that it'd be relatively difficult to deliver an IVL balloon, given that you have to use a low profile oh, yeah. balloon to deliver it here. And, and of course, this was set up to be an IVL type case. So <laughs> we're always selected that for that, as you used to say, as a relatively discreet. But w whenever you realize the equipment won't go, you have to then change the tag. So we have changed mm -hmm. to a rotational atherectomy approach uh, and then probably require a shockwave later in the case, because it's hey, quite a large vessel. You know, so what size of burr are you going to take in this situation? Yeah, I mean, let's ask Jerry. Uh, Jerry, what, what would you do here in terms of burr good. size? Right, would you, would, would that, would the size, the potential size of the burr, influence uh, the risk of plaque shift here? Nice. Uh, All right. Yeah, uh, in this particular case, I think the the LED size is about three o. Uh, so I think uh, one point right, five would be a little bit too small. So I. I, I I would prefer to use a 1.75. Interesting. Well, maybe that's why your cases are easier. So I'm going with a, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm just going to keep riding that one. Anyway, uh, so that's, I've actually opted for, a, okay, a 1.5 burr here for a couple different reasons, actually. Number one, I want to try and avoid uh, any plaque shift if at all possible. Number two, we've had really good success uh, with 1.5 burrs actually creating enough space to deliver shockwave balloons. Mm -hmm. And what I really want to harness is, is the, 
IVL capacity here to treat this lesion as opposed to the debulking power uh, of mm -hmm. the atherectomy device. Mm -hmm. So I will say, uh, since I have had IVL, I haven't used anything bigger than one five burr. Um, but again, our experience is so much less. Are you guys ready to rock and roll? Y yeah, I think we're, yeah, I think we're, right. that, that's a good point. Again, Robert, that comes down to your, drill, huh? your goals of therapy. If your goal is debulking, you want a larger burr. If your goals are facilitation, roll. actually a smaller burr does the trick. And we had the previous webinar last week focused a lot on this kind of concept of a pragmatic goal setting where you adapt your goals to the, the lesion you're treating here. You want to essentially facilitate adequate calcium modification right, and you right. want to minimize any consequent risks of perforation or vessel damage. Colin, do you have a kind of um, a way of, you know, adapting rotational atherectomy to this new environment where we've got more tools available? Um, yeah, well, I think we maybe are a bit more mindful of cost, so I would try and use one calcium modification technology. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we're obviously setting out for the two, so I would try to be, so I, I would probably have taken a 175 burr here to try and modify this with uh, rotational atherectomy, we haven't committed to that, um, but we don't get stuck in any one uh, particular uh, mode, you know, and we, and we move very quickly between them. Uh, what's very nice to see is how quickly uh, Rob's team have got the road ablation out, set up and in, yeah. and it's not considerably delay in this case, as suspect of anything is going to uh, save us a bit of time. Yeah, I think the worst you can do is get stuck in this fruitless loop of let's try another balloon or let's yeah. try another balloon or why don't we try a smaller balloon or... And, and uh, I'm trying to bully balloons and, and high pressure balloons and I think if you don't modify the calcium adequately and go in with, with high pressure balloon, I think that's when you run your risk of perforation. I think you're more likely to get a, uh -huh. uh, a risk of perforation at that stage. Yeah, sure. I, I think what we've got in this sort of bifurcation scenario is our main focus is actually patient safety. The durability issue is obviously important but our primary objective today is to do this case safely for the patient, mm -hmm. hopefully with a good durable result. Yeah, I think yeah, it's we're really at that early stage, Cherry, where we don't really have a huge amount of information on what we're dealing with. We just realize the lesion is sufficiently angulated and calcific, then it's quite difficult to kind of um, do anything other than get to the next stage in the case. Rotational atherectomy allows you to get to the next stage where you understand, how, have you modified it sufficiently? Do you need to do something different? Uh, I think uh, the next step uh, is to, to do OCT again. Uh, yeah. Try to do OCT again because you will have a lot of information about uh, this plaque. If you have removed uh, enough uh, uh, calcium for the next steps, and uh, this is what you are trying to do now, I think. Yeah, I'm just switching out for a workhorse wire, and then we'll take the OCT down, and then okay. um, we'll probably just OCT before I wire that side branch again, just to avoid any problems with wrap because wiring it at this point pre post OCT doesn't change my risk profile right if the thing's yeah. pinched it's going to be pinched after the OCT yeah. too so but you, can, here. but you can see all the steps that are involved in this yes. and it is a complex case you know and rotational atherectomy hasn't really evolved very right. much Go over the years up, and uh, it'd be interesting to see if, if Rob had tried to wire that lesion with a new Before. wire rather than the microcatheter exchange but uh -huh. um, it still is quite a bit of an involved procedure which puts a lot of people off. Yeah, and I, I think actually, you know, what is making it more straightforward is that with the adoption of these C2 techniques where you're trapping yep. the wire and you're using microcasters, and again, that was almost developed as a function of the ineptitude of the rotor wire, of course, Colin. You had to, and, and, and I suspect this is at least a seven French guide C2 that Rob's got in, uh, with a radial approach, so that ad yeah, additional you know, real estate that, to, allow you, to allow you to use those C2 techniques. A seven French EBU three five that we delivered radially. Um, you know what happened was, you know, here I was just James and I were doing our practice, feeling really good about ourselves here in the states, and then come Simon and Colm just traipsing through over the pond and started making fun of all of our femoral approaches for really complex lesions, and so. Uh, we've we've, <laughs> we've tried to adapt to catch up to the rest of the world using a lot of seven French guides for these types of bifurcations. You know, you can often do six Frenches, but one of the, you know, obviously with one five burr, you know, even really bad calcium at this point, six French guide, one five burr and IVL, you, you really don't have to use sevens. The only sort of change in that is when you have big bifurcations like this. If I ended up having yeah. to do a two stent for this one, I really need a seven French to be able to get the types of balloons I'd need down for a DK or quillot, depending. 
And, and of course, that, those decisions, Robert, were really based on access site decisions and the downside of a larger burr in, the, in a femoral in a femoral access site, but with a radial access sh site and these kind of thin Good sheath uh, delivery casters, which you get, you really don't have a price to pay for a seven French. So I would use as a standards for left mains, bifurcations, obviously we're biradial for all our CTOs, column as well. So Exactly, and calcium modification. Calcium modification, rotational atherectomy. So it would be interesting to see what the OCT uh, shows us here. Well, the catheter's passed, so that's at, at least, at least uh, yeah, a good step forward. All right, brothers, you guys ready to rack and roll? Let me just see just if I'm ready. Bit. What's up? Do we have enough length to cover? Do yeah, you? we got enough length to cover the fluoro. What I want to make sure is look at the left main too, you know? Make sure we're not hiding anything that angiographically decided to be worse than I realized. Let me just uh, flare here, make sure we're all engaged. You Everybody's happy, it. flare, flare. You purged it. Uh, I did indeed. Thank you, James. It's just reminding me after we trapped, you know, to make sure that we purge the line because, you know, you entrain a bunch of air that way. All right, ready to go when you are, brother. Just keeping you on, on your toes is good to see, Robert. What you can, actually right, do, you can actually do a little test at that stage. We'll show you whether you've got clearance or not, but obviously oh, there is. Yes, nice, and we just did nice that. I don't know if you guys could see that. that. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's see what we see. So one of the things that's interesting, you know, back when we didn't have IVL, Oftentimes we would drill, we'd take some NC balloons in, you'd look at it expand and you'd say, well, that's what it is, right? Like I'm ready to go, right? And then we'd put some stents in and every now and then you'd feel, I don't know, again, I wanna use these cool British terms, but now I realize I don't know some of the mean, sometimes you'd feel a little disappointed. Um, and you'd say, oh my gosh, that stent's still underexpanded. And, and, and really IVL taught us, I think what the rest of the world already knew, which was you gotta image after you do calcium modification strategies, you gotta, gotta, gotta image to make sure that vessel's truly prepped and ready to go. So can you guys see the OCT okay? Yeah, yep. can. Yeah. Yep. Um, the swirl is a function of the, the poor OCT <laughs> catheter, not me, I just wanna make sure that's... Uh... <laughs> you see, definitely. <laughs> on upper so zoom. can you take us to that calcified spot, friend? Robert, you'll do a... Uh, you um, see here, these, this thick, you see, you mm. guys see this just extremely thick calcium through here. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, we, we rely on rotational atherectomy, you know, to obviously to create a hole. And in the past, we really desired for it to create fractures, right? Because mm. what we want to do is change compliance of this vessel. It's not just about, um, you know, creating a hole. It's about changing compliance in these thick calciums. And you can see through there, we haven't done that yet, right? You see the thick calcium without real fissures through the plane. So this is where our IVL is really going to change the game for us. So what's our distal reference lumen so we can get the appropriate sized IVL balloon? I think there's some, there's, I see fractures in it that does look to be. Yeah, there were a couple yeah, of Yeah, there is some yeah. superficial, yeah. some superficial yeah. fractures, but we just didn't see it in that thick segment all the way through, you know? Yeah. You might need to go a bit more distal than that. Uh, yeah, for your go to the healthy, go, go to the Yeah, left. let's go a little bit more distal to the, to the healthy stuff, you know what I mean? It's just that one, my first thought yeah, when I saw the there, OCT, yeah. Robert, was what a beautiful distal vessel. Yeah, if you go yeah. towards <laughs> two, three millimeters, if you go on, go on further to ah. the left. Yeah, I'd be going left. Yeah. Go there. left, go right to the left. Go a little bit left there, yeah. friend. A little bit further left, yeah. There you, go. Right. Yeah. There you yeah. go. So one, two, three. So how about prox? So what size balloon do you guys want me to use IVL? This will be good. So Robert, would you do a, a run from the diagonal back just to get all the information before yeah, proceeding? Absolutely. Might be just it, it looks like so we're gonna we're it, gonna do a diag back oct too you guys it looks to me it's Can a visual strategy blue, but um we, you may find some information on imaging which mm. actually i tell you what will you take me to that diag and look at the ostium that's one of the things with octs that's kind of nice yeah is we can look at the ostium of the diag as it comes through typically if we can See, there is see evidence it. of fractures there as you go down through yep. Um, yep. Obviously, that's just with the one fiber. Superficial fractures, yeah. yeah. You guys see the ostium of the diag through there? It does look relatively it clear, doesn't it? Yeah, I think yeah. it looks good. Yeah, Angel yeah. graphically, that fits as well. Huh? Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a good information showing that you, you can start with a provisional approach in this case for, for the side branch. Yeah. Do you still want me to OCT that diag, Colm? No, Happy well, I, I'm actually, you know, I, 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 I was just a, for an academic, uh, you know, but I, I think it's going to yeah. be a provisional, isn't it? And um, so what size IVL? No. Okay. I, th I think I think <laughs> I my uh, my OCT rep is showing me very large circle, saying the diag is fine. I believe that's his sign language for it's totally fine. Yep. Mm. Anywho, um, but I'm happy to do it just for an academic exercise. I'm going to wire it anyway. 
Um, okay, so will you guys talk to us about sizing of the IVL here? How, you know, do you guys size your IVL one-to-one? -one? How do you guys do it? EEM to EEM, do you, you know, edge to edge? How do you guys do it? Yeah, I mean, it, that's a good question, Robert. I think start with one-to-one. -one. I think one of the reasons why you don't need to worry about about What's you know size? Um, the Where size being five? too big is that we're only inflating to four atmospheres, so four. The, the apposition is probably a three the mechanism the for the shock waves to to modify the deep wall calcium. So it needs yeah. to be opposed to the vessel. Yeah. The, there is actually some basic science or bench data showing that the more compressed the balloon is, the less well it works actually. So. Again, that would argue for some sort of facilitation before you use the shockwave. But other than that, it's, it's not really like sizing an NC where you, there is a risk if you go to, you know, 140 atmospheres or whatever. Here you're going right. to four atmospheres and you're opposing the, sh the shockwave balloon to the vessel and then facilitating the treatment subsequent to that. So, so, so what do you guys one, think? Uh, one, would, a one, would, a, would, a, would a 3.0 distal va vessel, didn't we, distal reference? Yeah, I think it was a 3.0. It was easy 3.0, wasn't it? But I think mm -hmm. th a 3.0 would be fine here. Yeah. Okay. I don't because think there's much to choose in terms of efficacy between a 3.0 and a 3.5. It's not like a balloon sizing you're doing here. So, it, Cherry, yeah. I've got a question for you here, which is something that we've talked about before. You have a bifurcation, and as a consequence, you have this issue with the side load created by the bifurcation and therefore a difficulty in, in treating the kind of opposite side of the carina, if you like. Do you, hmm. well, how do you address that? Question, is, is there any particular techniques you would advocate Robert employs here? Yeah, I, I think that, that's why I, I, uh, I suggest to use a 1.75 burr hmm. because the risk of carina shifting will be lower if you use a bigger burr because mm. when you deploy the stent, you do not push too much toward the side branch, the carina. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think I, about that with the use of IVL, though? Does, does using IVL here change your yeah, thoughts about course, that carinal shift? I, yeah. I, I fully agree with you. So the fact that you have, you have the combination between with uh, uh, rotablation and IVL oh, is a good point. Yep. And yeah. by doing I IVL, you will uh, uh, make a lot of modification of the plaque, and then the risk of uh, carina shifting will be uh, uh, lower. But yeah. it will be very import important to respect the fractal law, so size the stents according to the distal very reference, clear. not to the proximal. Mm -hmm. Because if you size the stent according to the proximal, which is maybe 3.5, you will right. uh, push the carina and you take okay. the risk of closing the side branch or so, pinching the side branch. Yeah, because I'm always, you know, we're always learning from you guys about this stuff, right? You guys are so much farther ahead, have so much more of an experience base. So I always love kind of hearing your thoughts on this because you guys have seen it, you know, both from a practice standpoint and from an intravascular imaging standpoint, so many of these tips and tricks. So it's really lovely to actually hear these things. In terms of just our practical IVL stuff here. So we've got our balloon in, you guys see it delivered well. Um, one five burr, nothing else before, right? And this is the experience we've really had. You know, one five burr creates enough for even four O's and things like that. Where would you guys like me to start? I think it's very, it's very, very focal, Robert. You know, that's yeah. one thing about this lesion it is focal. So, you, you know, you can get a length from the from the bifurcation yeah, the, distally, but I would mm -hmm. just park it at the uh, at the diagonal. And uh, yeah, uh, and the question I was kind of driving so I've at before. I've actually gone just a fleur here. I've gone just a little distal to the diag because there's a yeah, big yeah, angiographic shelf just to make sure. Because again, we got 80 <coughs> pulses, right? So let's go ahead and go on up here to four. So we take this this balloon up to four, right? And this reduces the barotrauma. And then we're going to go ahead and we deliver 10 pulses. Um, just center that a wee not, bit in your angio, Robert, sort of. Yep, can we just center up screen. on that balloon, please, just so they can see it? Center the angio, friend. I'm right up to six. Seeing the hemo rather than the OCT, if possible. All right, perfect. And down. So you see there, we've got a little scalloping of the balloon right yep. there on the proximal edge. Absolutely. So go ahead and go back up here. We're going to deliver 20 rounds here and then move the balloon a little bit more proximal and just sort of work our way up. Rob, could we have the hemo rather than the OCT on the screen as well, just to see the hemodynamic effects? Please. Absolutely. Can we see the hemos on the screen live, guys? So this person, all right, go up to six. This person is not in training, and so nothing's happening. And down. Now we have much better expansion. That makes me feel pretty good, right? There's no scalping of the balloon. So now we're going to come a little bit more proximal, huh, Flora? Hey, one question, James, is would you use all 80 shocks uh, in this scenario, or if the balloon gives after 40, would you stop? 
Well, well, actually, here you've got such focal Careful, disease, you and you're not treating anything else, so I would give all 80. You would give all 80 to that area? Uh, absolutely, because yeah. it's a single vessel disease, it's provisional, you're not treating the side branch. We know That's that a balloon's good. not a very precise measure of oh. calcium fractures. Yeah. Right, go ahead and go up here, please. why not deliver it all? It's a slightly more different scenario if you're going to, say, do a left main bifurcation, you've got the, the circ osteo, you've yeah, got yeah. the LED osteo. So you might be a bit, a, bit, more frugal. a bit more parsimonious, I was going to use, because it's, that's an upgraded word from frugal. It is. <laughs> that is up to six, please. No, I fully agree with you. I, I would yeah, I, I must. I, I, I won't yeah. necessarily Much use better. all um, if I if I see if I've got a good okay. balloon expansion, um, but I've no rationale for that other than maybe mm. you know there is a lot of energy delivered, but it's right. not based go ahead on go any up there, please. Uh, data. Yeah. No, but if you again, if you we look at the bench test, right. what is the risk of delivering more energy here? It Where actually it just, just passes through bubble. fibrous tissue. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no heat yeah. uh, effect. Yeah, you know, there's a, they're almost a flat line in terms of thermal energy. Um, if there is calcium, it fractures the calcium, but of course that's what you're using it for. So if it works, it works, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Not going to you know, there isn't a, a flip side of, uh, of expending the energy in a harmful fashion. Yeah, and as you say, it doesn't look like we're going to need to use the balloon for, say, the diagonal in this situation, so. No, no, I mean, it's, it's the interface between the compliant and the non-compliant tissue where it creates these shock waves of the fractures actually have their effects. Yeah. So, uh, one of the kind of question I was driving at earlier so with Jerry was with the side load, particularly if it's a two stent strategy. I wonder if there's a rationale in having a kissing balloon early, you know, to, to actually make sure you direct the force in the right area. Yeah. Go in a All little right. bit. So, Flora, so you guys want me to go in a little bit more? Uh, yeah, I think you know, go a little bit further down. Uh, and to clarify that, James, you're talking about a, a pre dilation of such kissing balloon inflation yeah. with, with NC balloons. Yeah. Yep. Or it doesn't even have to be NC because any sort of balloon will basically there, kind please. of um, stop the kind of balloon bulging into the space, so yeah. the side load, if you like. And it, from a shockwave perspective, it may what actually create the, the kind of reverberation artifact that you want uh -huh. to augment the shock waves. You know, we, for example, we say, and we all know that shock Six. waves are more effective for concentric Six. calcium. Yeah. And right. this is never going to be concentric calcium in a bifurcation because yeah. there's a big, there's there's a big space hole. on yeah. one side. Right. And that almost creates a, a more concentric yeah. effect. Just a theory, but. Well, well, it's certainly <laughs> worth exploring, you know, and, and I think, um, I think if we talk about bifurcations, the main area of failure is the ostium of the side branch, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We very rarely get stent failure in the main Sydney. vessel. Um, if you think of the left main, it's the ostium yeah. of the cirque. Like and um, so things like the DK double curse came along to try and optimise the ostium of the bifurcation okay. before proceeding to your second stent. So I think what you're suggesting is making sure you've optimised the ostium of the diagonal before putting a stent in the main vessel. Well, kind of what I'm actually suggesting is that you modify the back wall of the vessel you're trying to treat. Yeah. And that's the bit hardest bit to treat. And actually, I think the reason you see failure in the side branch more frequently is because it's quite often not the goal of therapy. Correct. You know, you get a provisional and the side branch is an afterthought. Yeah. And you do the left main and the circ is almost an afterthought. That's right. And it's certainly not treated with the same level of respect as Correct. the main vessel. That's why I think it fails more. Yeah, I agree. All right. All right, guys. So should we OCT again? Yes, that'll be good. So, Robert, the last time I was OCT in your again? center, um, I don't know if you remember, but you did a case where you used a, a peripheral shockwave in an, in an LED. We I'm not allowed to say that. And in terms of deliverability, <laughs> this, is, this is a day and night. Um, yes. <laughs> and um, cut. <laughs> this was a, it was a peripheral balloon over the wire balloon. Okay. And what length is a okay. peripheral? I think it's 40, 40, 40 millimeters. Yeah. And yeah. It, it got there and it worked. But you know, in terms Flare of deliverability, it was a completely sure different engaged animal. Yeah. yeah. All right, floor store that. All right, guys, so we're going to OCT again. You delivered uh, uh, 80 pulses? Uh, we did deliver all 80 pulses, and we were sort of chatting with uh, Theory a little bit on, uh, he directed me a little bit more distal, uh, kind of to, to deliver everything else. We delivered all 80 through there, and we had very good balloon expansion. Um, do you want me to go back through the Cines, or were no, you guys no, no, sort no, of it's watching all good. We, we got that, Robert, just, uh, just confirming yeah, yeah. ahead of the OCT. 
Absolutely. So this OCT will really let us know, did we modify that really thick calcium and particularly in that focal little area? You know, one of the things that's challenging, Flora, is that when we have these focal areas, it's, you know, one of the worst CTOs, you know, I can get referred to these short little buggers that you really think you should just wire quickly and they end up being awful. You know, you, you can't wire them easily, integrate or retrograde and, and doing reverse cart, getting subintimal is a beast as well too. Um, and it's the same thing with these calcified lesions. You don't always even get concentric calcium making um, fluoro here, making all of the limitations of our different calcium modifications fluoro here really shine in terms of either atherectomy or IVL. All right, you guys ready to rock? Yep. Yep. All right, let's go, brother. And Cine. All right. And so first, let's just comment on the angio. What do you guys think? Is. This, isn't it? Look at that. Do you see? Look how like Z jagged that thing is, huh? I know. Just eccentric. I'm going to be honest. Based on the angio, we'll see what this looks like. This may not be the worst idea just to do an NC balloon after that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Just yeah. to just to make sure that it would get a good expansion there. Yeah, I think it's can a good I, point. Can I get a 20 NC balloon, please? And if we get, you know, if it straightens there, out, fine, know. fine. Yeah, look at that. And look at the difference there. It's such a good not, example. Not a chair, sir, yeah, it's yeah. very difficult to make a colon. A lot of that, Robert, I think, because because his colon said the clearances. Here, here's what I'm going to do. Let me just uh, flare here. That's my apologies. You know what we're going to do? We're going to do that again. Let me just get the guide in a bit more. There we go. Sorry, it was deep seating a second ago. Just getting that IVL balloon in and out, and I think it just popped out with me maneuvering flare here. Use a low threshold fusion to guide cath extension to improve the picture quality change in this situation. Uh, absolutely, and reduce the contrast as well, of course, but you've got to probably give up your second right, let's wire. Let's do it again, brother. Well, if you yeah, that was my French, only... You might you be okay with right. this. If you have some French guide, you can keep your wire. Mm -hmm. You ready, Tim? Do another run. Yeah, that was kind of my thought, exactly. And certainly if you thought you wouldn't need the guide cath extension for stent delivery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And Sine? That there we looked, go. That Hold looked on. a lot better, Robert, didn't it? I actually used my, my big hands. I, yeah. You know, I've been doing some ball <laughs> exercises last night, and I really feel like they paid off. In fact, I should have done them two days ago last night. I think that was actually too. James yeah. injecting, wasn't it, Robert? Let's be honest <laughs> with this, please. I, it's not nice when the people you're doing live cases with know you and know all of your little, <laughs> little tricks. There's a local phrase we say, you had your Weetabix this morning, but that doesn't necessarily translate internationally. So. No, I don't think so. No, I, I know Weedabix. Can you take us to that calcified segment, my friend, and just show it? Look at that. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Look at no, the difference there yeah. between no the row. No question right. there, is there? <laughs> I think we're yeah. good. In fact, based on this OCT, I don't see know what, that we need this no. NC balloon. Do you well, guys want me to use the, the NC the diagonal or diagonal no? there, you can see the ostium looks very clear. I, th Huge. I think the, the question you're asking, Robert, is the question a lot of people are asking. How do I, how do I know that compliance has been sufficiently yeah, yeah, restored? Yeah, 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 yeah. And what we're doing here is we're using anatomy as a surrogate marker of that. And you actually, when you inflate an NC balloon, you're using physiology as a marker of compliance. You're saying the pressure right, in, in that balloon is higher than the compliance of the vessel. So, you know, there are two different measures, but the, I would have said here the anatomy, I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear Cherry's thoughts, but the anatomy is so definitive here, it doesn't look like you need any further modification ahead of stent implantation. I think that OCT is pretty. <laughs> <laughs> what else exactly are you going to do to that vessel without, yeah, <laughs> without what, what testing you, the limits of the adventitia? What do you think, Terry? Have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree, but I, I think in terms of uh, stand delivery, I, I would use uh, a 3 0 non compliant balloon. You would? To, yeah. to okay. be sure that uh, Can I get that you would be able to deliver the stents. The other thing is that. Well, uh, let's do it. We have seen that, we have seen that the, the size of this LED is going bigger and bigger uh, just because you have done mm -hmm. a good. Uh, yeah. Uh, opening of the lesion. Yeah. And now it's uh, more. Isn't that always the case? Closer huh? to 3.5 than 3.0. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think hey, Robert. Tim, did we change our size on that OCT? If can you, you just check if our If you guys reference? come on screen, you and James, so we can see your beautiful faces. And then just make sure that you've got your distal landing zone. Uh, you know, what's with up? reference to Cherry's point, because uh, this is a big LED. And what's the, the size if you go there? for the proximal, the proximal vessel is mm. what, four and a half millimeters, mm. is it, as uh, uh, imaging? So, yeah. and it's a relatively small diagonal, proximal so it'd be four. unusual to go from 4.5 to 3 
as a distal reference. I think that's the point Terry's making. What um, size stent do you think we should uh, we should use here, Flora? Well, if you can make that distal reference closer to three five, yeah. which I think we would all like, yeah. then it's a relatively simple what sum. Is, but if it's a three up to four five, then a bit blurry there. Problem is, is it's truly a three zero down there by measurement. Is it? Go ahead, going up here, please. It is indeed. Did you which remeasure it after a bit of flow? That's what I just asked. Oh. Actually, is, is to remeasure it. Going up there, twelve, please. Huh? Can we ask for another remeasurement? <laughs> Do we get the size we want? <laughs> <laughs> down. See, so Terry, to your point, you see how it straightens there. I think that makes us feel very comfortable about what a stunt's going to look like. Flare here. Are you guys good with that? I think there's a good step, yeah, I you know, I don't think it's completely necessary, but in the purpose of education, what you're doing is you're showing that your balloon's going to expand and therefore your stent will expand, so it's a good step. Yeah, yeah. well, and it's kind of nice too. It just goes back to this point you guys were making earlier of we've got, you know, anatomy, you know, is our compliance okay looking at the OCT versus the physiology of the balloon expansion? It's nice to know yeah. they match up in this case. All right, so it's time to yeah, stand, guys. Good. Let's bring the OCT up and let, uh, let our panel make the final decision on what size stent to use. Okay. So, I, so we're going to press play here, guys. Just yeah, I, I made some calculation according to the, if we think that the, the LED is 3.5 distal to the bifurcation and the diagonal is 2.25, sure uh, the calculation make that uh, the proximal LED proximal to the bifurcation should be 3.8. There you yeah, go. It's, Jerry's on the sum. Jerry's on the sum. He's, he's, he's put column to shame. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And guys, can we see your faces in Cincinnati, please? Um, oh, yeah. The, we'll the OCT the is we'll beautiful, the but you guys are even more beautiful, so. <laughs> All right. So did you guys make a decision on what we wanted to do stent-wise? Yeah, Terry just told you. Oh. So okay. So well, I will um, a three we'll just five replay and that last bit then. The length okay. is what? And 20. Looks at 28. 28, 33, 30. 38. I can't okay, see the numbers in that, can you? No, I can't, not, well, I thought it was just my eyesight. There's a little, it's all blurry, What's that, the your, your OCT for us, Robert, so we can't see the exact so. length. We're going to do a 3532. Is everybody yeah. good with that? Sounds right. good. Sounds good. Can we get a 3532, please? And then we're going to, so what we're going to do, you know, based on that OCT imaging, and it did, it did really plump up after that. And I have to say, sometimes that's really frustrating on, on imaging is that we'll image it, we'll prep it based on the image it, We'll put the scent in, and then we'll go back down. And sure enough, the, the, particularly the distal vessel will have grown some, uh, you know, even if with the best measurements and you end up having to posting it a little bit more. And that's why that's sort of the modified music criteria, whatever you want to use, you know, in terms of stent optimization really also hinges on that post divis imaging for stent optimization as well. So, so that's a great point. The 3.5 and the 3.0 stent are probably the same stent here. Um, so you can go, you could go with a 3.0 and, and post it, but, um, if you're taking a 3.5 and you're slightly worried about the distal reference, is deploy it at nominal rather than deploying at high pressure and then do the high mm -hmm. pressure inflation with the NC balloon. Exactly. And the other nuance I think is interesting here, Column, is that when you have such a depressed LV as this, you get this, the, the vessels all seem to be more vasoconstricted or less and, and dilated we, anyway. And if you brought this you know, back in a couple mm -hmm. of weeks' time, we, we know from our mm -hmm. CTO experience that, that it's not going to be three, it's going to be closer to three, five, or four, you yeah, know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Exactly. Well, so you've got to give it a chance. What you do want to do is implant a stent platform that exactly. doesn't allow you to post dilate or yeah. overinflate. Uh, and we saw it in about 20% of the CTO oh. cases and consistent oh. that the, the, you had to do an additional... So you see how smooth that goes? It's quite mm -hmm. nice, right? Yeah. So let me just check my distal here, flare here. So it looks like we've got the distal there, huh? Maybe a bit Maybe further, a bit further in. Yeah. It's very hard to see. We're, we're losing a bit, and it's a bit grainy, Flare. Rob. So you're, it's obviously a share call. All right, Cindy here from my friends. All right, looks like we've got that. You guys good with that? Yeah, I think that looks Right fine. at the edge. Come to that spider, please, and just check the prox. It's good. Prox is fine. I've sort of yeah, go a bit more distally bit, even. Bit more yeah. distal round, but it's yeah. We just want to see what kind of landing room we have up top, and then we can sort of inch it down just a bit. Looks like you've got tons up top, doesn't it? It's funny. You really regret taking a thirty-eight in these cases. No, right? that's right. Yeah. Here. Particularly when it's such a normal vessel distally, you know. You oh, we got plenty of room. Yeah, just like room. Uh, yeah. all right, fine, fine, fine. All right, let's go back to this view, please. Back to the AP green. We'll go down just a bit. Let's go past that little sub goal. Yeah. So much judgment. And, All right. and, <laughs> <laughs> and that, that LED, it's, it goes a long way, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's a big old vessel. It's friggin' huge. Yeah, so. 
All right, so we'll go in just a bit there. Huh? There we go. Yeah, so the symptoms here were, were heart failure, Robert, is that correct? They were actually both. Cindy here. Yeah, you know, I, I bet you this gentleman Everybody knows a big, here, huh? a big uh, improvement in symptoms. Yeah. With all right, let's go ahead and go on up. Uh, yeah, so both actually. So angina and uh, dysmenorrhea exertion and uh, NYHA class three dysmenorrhea mm -hmm. exertion and CCS class three angina despite off medical therapy, uh, 11. 11, that's a strangely precise uh, and down. number, Robert. Down well, we have to have some objective, you know. And for an objective number, it's a strangely subjective choice. Uh, this is a, this is truth. <laughs> this is truth. Well, I can't. I, you, you're obviously 100 percent on that one. Can I get a 4015, please? No, you guys are 100 percent correct. But from an AUC, from a decision-making standpoint here in the states, we these we use these little little subjective objective markers, you know. So one of the things that I think has slipped into our practice, James, would be that we would leave a bit more length in bifurcation work so that you've got, you know, if we drop the six millimetres proximally, you have to use a six millimetre balloon for that pot. Okay. Um, so taking a few extra millimetres just to give yourself, mm -hmm. I know Rob's a call for Good a 15 idea. millimetre balloon there, so he, he must have plenty of room proximal to bifurcation, but you've got to be with inside the struts. Yeah, and I, again, Colm, I guess it depends on what you're pot is trying to do and what the proximal yeah, so vessel is like. So what do you guys want like. me to do with this uh, side branch wire here, huh? I, I leave it in until I've got a post-dilation balloon in, uh -huh. because mm -hmm. if you were to pull it at the moment to form the proximal part of the stent, mm -hmm. that can be hard to salvage, but you're going to mm -hmm. post-dilate the main vessel anyway, so if you put that balloon in now, do the pot, and then if you put your 3 ONC balloon in the distal part, um, if you get deformation, you can retrieve the situation, just a, mm -hmm. a personal practical point. So we've and got a 4 here we'll do the prox with. We'll take the balloon out as soon as we flare, as soon as we get this balloon in. And, and Jerry, of course, the, the pot part of the procedure is something which you've really championed over the years, and it's of mm -hmm. critical importance, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, wh whatever the technique you use, uh, pot okay. is crucial when you so do hold bifurcation. Hold on just a sec. We're going to take our okay. other wire back, Flair. Uh, if you do a DK crush, for example, you have to do three pots to have an optimal result. Right, dry Cindy here, please. If you do a culotte, All you right. can do at least two pots. You look pots. good, right? Provisional, right. at least one. Go ahead and going up here to 12, please. So I think it's always the same. So uh, you, 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 you remove the, the and down. side branch wire. Why that? Flair here. Uh, it has been a little bit of practice after we get this NC balloon in just to make sure we don't trap because we had it after the stent was deployed. Can we get a 30 NC please? A 30 you would check flow in the side the branch. The side branch is uh, is uh, good for safety reason. Mm -hmm. If you push the carina, you have an occlusion of the side branch. If you have so a you wire keep it in place, even when you post still. And huh? always solve the, this issue. It's lovely. Hmm. A lot of different views on that, but I think that's a, a really I, nice point there. And, and I guess, I, I guess there's, there's two, the two points you're trying to balance here, Cherry, is the, the, the keeping the side branch open and acting as a sort of pseudo target, because it's not a precise mm -hmm. target, versus the risk of entrapment. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, Colm, do you think the risk of entrapment's high? No, I think so, and I think you can't properly optimize the front end of the stent uh -huh. because it will be pulled away from the vessel wall with that side branch wire. There you go. I suppose it's um, if that diagonal branch goes down, mm -hmm. um, you can at least retrieve the situation and end up with a crush in the main vessel. So I would lean towards leaving it there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the, the trade-off is if you don't properly optimize the front end of the stand, you can catch equipment going through. So it is a trade-off mm -hmm. and a balance. And, and listen, coming back to you, Cherry, on, on, on the pot scenario, so are, would, you, would your practice change according to the wire you use? Would you, for example, if you had a polymeric wire in the side branch, would that, would that change your view on, on, on what you would do with that wire? Uh, I think the, the only wire who is uh, at risk is a choice PT. Uh, but we don't use it uh, in my lab. I, I, I don't know if it's still available in, uh, in the world. Sadly, uh, yes. <laughs> and yes. Sadly, okay. yes. The other challenge uh, the other you have wires, is a BMW. I think there is no issue. And uh, uh, of course, what is very important is uh, if you trap the wire, you should no, not yes, go to yeah. very high Price pressure here. or very, very high diameter approximately. Okay. But also, go also go the here, length please. of the stent Waiting. is also 16. very important. So if you have a very long stent, you have to be very careful. Uh, uh, if you use two stents, so you put a stent on the bifurcation and then you put another one proximally, 
uh, then trapping the wire with two stents okay. uh, increase the difficulty Same thing. to uh, remove the, the gel wire. And actually, there is a, a column, as we know, some bench testing that if you put a polymeric wire in the side branch, you do strip polymer. Yeah. It's not theoretical, no. you strip polymer. Yeah, it's just the true. clinical consequence, consequence of that is, is unclear. But it's, got, it's certainly not going to be a good thing, is it? No, but uh, you know, we, we will be stripping polymer off stents as we malhandle them in these scenarios as Surely well. Not. So. <laughs> it's a fair point, huh? Claire? It's a very you know, fair point. You, so we're going to. Uh, the the stents and the amount of calcium and the high pressure we go to, we will be disrupting them compared to uh -huh. uh, the bench tests in, in, in the factory. So it's, is it clinically right. relevant? I guess the question is if you think something is a potential mechanistic problem and you can avoid mm -hmm. it, w yeah. why, 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 why shouldn't you avoid yeah. it? You know? So, Robert, you're going to do a repeat OCT after yeah, post should make sure. Yeah, we should make sure that we have good stent expansion apposition, ensure we don't have any proximal or distal edge dissections, and make sure that we didn't land in any plaque, you know, the basic sort of fundamentals of proper stent yeah. implantation. Uh, no. uh, James, uh, the, the other point with uh, trapping wire is that uh, when you pull back the wire, the guiding catheter is attracted. Yeah. Of course. So, so you have to take control Plural. of this guy, the guy, the guiding catheter. That's a good point to there, be dude. sure that you will not damage the stents. Really uh, good point, dude. I think that's a critical point. It's also, yeah. you know, a very underappreciated point, uh, yeah, Jerry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then also with respect to proximal optimization, you and know, I, crossing. I, I find the commonest mistake when we go back to check the OCT result or the right. IVRS result is that we've missed the front edge mm -hmm. of the stent. Mm -hmm. You know, we think we've covered it and we oh, haven't, like, and oh, that's yeah. very common. Yeah. Yeah. Um, question for you guys, Fleuro. So we're lucky in that we have, I'll give you this, and that we have OCT, uh, that we have IVL, right? Let's talk about all the things you would have had to have done if we hadn't employed that, you know, prior to IVL. Do you guys mind sort of commenting on what you would have done? Not at all. Um, I think it would have been a, a one five burr, a one seven five burr. Then yeah, it would have been flare. an NC balloon, um, and then probably an OPN balloon. Maybe bit, you know, cutting balloon, uh, and then OPN balloon. Yeah. So uh, trying to sort of deal with it with borrowed from it rather than right. I think that's right. I, actually, there there is a, 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 a kind of school of thought in that we'd been more likely to need a two stand right, strategy. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, well, I think we, if you look back, you know, we, we, we accepted city. less good results because we didn't have uh, solutions, you know. Yeah. So um, if you were to look back at a, at a calcium modification case that you did three, four so years ago, you'd probably 30. shake your head and say, well, I wouldn't be doing that through most of the steps. But then you didn't have the options. Uh, the option that we that talked about really? last year yeah, in Cincinnati, you used a peripheral. Yeah. Uh, shockwave balloon because there's no coronary one, you know, and... we get me a 4020 NC? It, it's, it's much easier when you've got all the tools. Let's take a look at this yeah, here, guys. What do you guys think? Not, not only that, I think, um, Colin, but we, we, we wouldn't have taken on many cases yeah. because of it. And, well, you know, I think the MSA is the key here. You know, last week's webinar, we focused on the difference between... Uh, Side looks good, though. You know, yeah. a, a non geometrically opposed Tim? stent and the MSA. And the MSA is king, so it Do doesn't really matter anymore? whether the stent is D shaped or not. It's what, what is the MSA and the, rel the relative yeah, versus the absolute MSA. Okay. It looks a bit you funny in the front end, five? actually. Yeah. yeah, that's what we were looking at. We're actually going to take a four or five in there if you guys are okay with that. And is that, is that, a, is that a proximal edge dissection we're seeing up at 11 o'clock? And is there a proximal edge dissection, Tim? Can you take a look? That's what we were just screwing around with here. It's swirl that you see it's up swirl. there, but okay, so it's just, just uh, there's, yeah, blood artifact. But we could also we could also pop it down to a to a caudal and take a look too, if you guys want to. I, I would be not very confident that I've seen the front no. edge well enough. But if you're going to do a post dilation with yeah. four or five, you may as well do that because it looks like there is a bit of uh, malopposition there. So it's probably yeah, worth do doing that? that, and then as you say. Yeah, use the contrast for the next one. I'll tell you one. what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to do a 4 or 5, then I'm going to take a guide extension. And are you guys cool with that? Sounds good. Yeah. We'll take a 7 French guide um, what, extension. What as well. is your MSA at the moment, just yeah. uh, just for interest? Can you, get us our, uh, can you get us our MSA, Tim? It just looks like the front end needs tidied up. I wouldn't be going too far. No, 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 no. Just, just, just that front end, just right there at the diagonal. Um, so um, we've got 5.17 at this point. Remember, this is by OCT, obviously. Okay. Is that you, you're wondering if that's the section at four o'clock? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the proximal edge, you're talking about? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 
Yeah, we'll take that four, five, fifteen. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's do the four, five, fifteen, and then we'll uh, take that guide extension in and see if we can just get it just in the left main to get a little less swirl right there at the front end. But certainly in the area that most calcium looks excellent, pump, doesn't hey, it? If you go down to the area where that was heavily calcified, yeah, take, take us to that mid part yeah. of the stent, mm -hmm. Robert, so we can have a look at where so the IVL therapy was delivered. Take us to that mid part of the stent where that uh, calcium fracture was. Show us where the diagonal see. is, and then go to the left beyond the diagonal. I think the area where most. Let's of the go to the diag and then come. Just sorry, they they can't hear you, and so I'm just trying to relay. You're trying to. Yeah, the, English is my first language. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what. Okay, <laughs> so um, there we go. Come back. Go to the left a little bit. Yeah, so Keep it going. looks again sort of bit of needs to be opposed a little bit the stand there as well. Probably just because of the eccentric calcium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's only you know with the eccentricity like that, there's mm. there's only so much one can do. You know, mm -hmm. really. I see true. the calcium up at one o'clock. It's. It looks very good, though, you'd have mm -hmm. to say. Yeah. yeah, to be honest, I think it looks mm -hmm. quite good. There's no distillation oh, no, 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 And the area there is... Actually, I'll take this, yeah. But certainly in the area of calcium, looks to be yep. very acceptable. The diagonal is good flow. I don't yep. think you're going to do anything else with the diagonal unless no. there's a, a, a remarkable change with this next post dilation. And then the question is, from the end of the stent, whether... Yeah, but is you, there any trauma there? So, Cherry, is there any formal assessment you'd make of the side branch, or would it just be... Would you use physiology? Yeah, would you use yeah, yeah, any other type yeah, of imaging, or would you just accept an angiographic result? Yeah, I, I think it's... Uh, in this particular case, because there is another diagonal, so the first one before, which is the same size, I think the relevance of this diagonal is very... Uh, very limited. significant, right? Uh, so I think uh, it will be probably uh, less than two segments of ischemia. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think having, even, even if you have a positive uh, uh, FFR less than 0.8, I'm not sure that you will need to do something. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, actually. Really, really good point, huh? Of course, if it was a, a unique one, I don't any there. Uh, no, 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 the one proximally. Uh, maybe uh, to assess and to do something. So it, be, it could be a particularly right, say if it was a left yeah. main. Yeah. It would be, could be a very different answer to that oh, question. Hold on down. You pulled it. Oh back, yes, brother. of course. Yeah. I think this is where the clear stand and the stand you can make a play where you've got heavy calcification and the cine. We're so okay. mindful of radiation go ahead, go on up. that um, we reduce the dose. You can't quite see the front end of the stand. No. And I think a clear stand or, or stand With boost 12. in this situation yeah. is probably worth those few additional rays. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and down. You guys feel good about that? Very important point, I think. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's really complementary to uh, the imaging. To use, uh, uh, stand you guys want me to do any more, or you want me to repeat OCT here? That was a four, five to twelve at the front stand edge. Yeah, no, it looks looks good. I mean, maybe you can use a balloon to do a stent enhancement, just to show the two diameters of the stent proximal to the diagonal, distal to the diagonal, okay. good expansion, etc. That's where. What we'll do as we will Let's come back. take this guide extension back in. But I, I think we've become so mindful of radiation with the CTO cases that sometimes in non CTO cases we're, we're too frugal with it. And uh, I think, I think you're, you're probably not wrong. Worth increasing the res for the stent boost. I think and you're not wrong. Just yeah. ensuring you get that very front end because the penalty of missing it is significant. Yeah, and you, but you, you yeah, do I'm see that you. on imaging. It's just that you don't see it as a live co registration. Yeah. And I think that, that's, that's the issue. You know, I think if. Coming if up. there was yeah, an yeah, IVA yeah. solution to that problem, a live co-registration, co right. but then you still got to balloon it. Exactly. So, so you get through, you know. I, I, I actually suspect the robot ultimately will be a solution to this, yeah, where yeah, you know it's, it's locked in. Right. But I, I right, think there is a rule for, for the robot. It's in this sort of case where you procedurally plan and then you follow the steps. So let's OCT this again, Flora. But I do think, gosh, some really salient points here. And this is why I picked this case. I wasn't totally sure how it was going to go, but I did think we'd probably have to drill. Um, and I just think the imaging, and that's why I picked OCT too, because I think the dramatic difference in the imaging, you know, shows the difference of, you know, what atherectomy does compared to IVL. And it's such a difference in mechanism of action because people all the time, you know, they ask, you know, why is this different than atherectomy? You know, we have all these meetings and all these people want to talk about all the different features and it's just nothing shows you like an OCT image, you know, if you can get a good one without swirl and being able to see the proximal edge flur here. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, uh, Robert. And it's amazing how 
images sometimes have this emotional power to change behavior that actually text doesn't have. Yep. So, as you know, obviously in Optima, we get, believe uh, quite strongly in that. Just, <laughs> I think this is where the advantage is, isn't it? The stent uh, uh, delivery and uh, optimization. Sorry, we're just changing a contrast bottle. And I think the other just really important part of this is, you know, this is someone with a low EF who cannot tolerate that diet going down, right? They just, I mean, you know, any sort of push or shove on that is just not going to be acceptable. Uh, this person needs all of their myocardium revascularized and all of the different machinations we would have had to have done if we didn't have IVL, you know, that you guys sort of alluded to in terms of, you know, whether it be high pressure OPNs versus, you know, cutters or all these different specialty balloons, you know, all these things and significant risk of shutting that diag down in somebody who just really would not tolerate it. I just think this makes this procedure fluoro so much safer for people. And it's just going to change what people's tolerance for things is fluoro here. Because to be honest, I don't think this case is done at a lot of places because of that worry. All right, ready for you. City. All right. Am I going to get less judgment on this one, or what's the deal? Well, we'll, we'll just reserve judgment on whether we give you judgment uh, or not here, Robert. Yeah. There's a guideline in there, yeah. friend. Yeah. We've got better clearance anyway. Well done. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> way to actually do it properly. <laughs> so judgy. Mm. It's the last time. All right. Take me to. Stent looks quite good, quite good. Let us good be the expansion. judge of that, Robert. <laughs> oh, okay, my fault, my fault. I'll just go That's ahead right. and self, just self keep prepping my no manifold phase. here. Yeah. yeah, I'll keep prepping my manifold here. So I can <laughs> just... All right, so we're up to six. So check that right there, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. front edge. It's a bit of a, bit of a challenge. Yeah. We'll probably need to tack that up, huh? Yeah. Decent tear there, isn't there? One, two, three. All right. So what's our size there, Tim? Do a little short top hat on that. I think you just need the proximal vessel mm, yeah. reference. Yeah, a four, five, six or something mm -hmm. like that. Four, five, eight. Yeah, I'm thinking we'll just do a, what do you think? You a have a guide eight? cath extension, have you? Yeah, it's one of them. We in do. There. Yeah. So it'll be worth uh, inserting that through the front struts if you can. Mm -hmm. um, but very little risk of, of any LSD here, yeah. uh, Column, because it, it's certainly opposed to the vessel wall, isn't it? So. All right, so what do you guys think? Uh, you, you think of 408? Tim? All right. Can I get a 408, please? He's measuring that out at 40. So, all right. Um, so, yeah. let's. You see take... this quite a bit, Jerry, um, that there is a downside to proximal optimization, or do you think that was just the initial lesion preparation that caused that tear? I think that was. Uh, it's difficult to say, but I think uh, when we do. Can I get a. Proximal get, optimization technique, uh, we always use short balloons, so 8 millimeter, maximum 12. 3, 5, uh, 8 to be nice. sure that you uh, will not be outside of extension. the stand. Can I get that 4 ONC back, please? And of course, we check by actually, I'll uh, take that 3 ONC. using uh, um, stent, um, uh, stent boost or stent enhancement. It's very important to really check that mm -hmm. the balloon is inside the stand. Yeah. yeah. To be honest, it's pretty uncommon to get proximal edge sections like this. Uh, you know, I would I would say we really don't mm -hmm. we really don't see it that often. But you know, it's really good to only check, your right? word for it, Robert. This is one out of one from our perspective. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. We'll just say it's very common. <laughs> I, 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 I suspect maybe a 38 might have just covered that extra bit of disease. But you know, it's it's and you're better dealing with this now. It's, it's not it's not a biggie. Um, I think it'd be crazy not to, wouldn't oh, yeah. call them That's a decent going dissection. No, but what I mean is that you know by uh, optimizing the stent uh, aggressively to get a good lumen, yeah. you run the risk of getting a proximalized dissection. Yeah. But the trade-off is you've got a bigger area, and yeah. if it results in an additional stent in the front end, I think mm -hmm. that's worth it. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and actually, can I just, Terry, just back to you again then, if you're doing your proximal optimization, is it an NC balloon you use or a compliant balloon? And, and, and what are the reasons behind that? Or does it even matter? I got it. Yeah, it, it really depends on the, the, the kind of lesion that you are treating. So uh, sure. usually uh, both are OK. Uh, if you have a size which is close to the, the size of the balloon, a semi-compliant balloon, and if it's not classified, mm -hmm. semi-compliant balloon is OK. Mm -hmm. If uh, you are, uh, if you have okay. to go to high go pressure, here, you have uh, to, 
application, uh, we prefer to use non-compliant. So it's re it's fully and open. And stay on Flora, please. Flora. Your decision to use uh, one uh, NC or SC balloon. All right. Yeah. According so to we'll take the stent anatomy. Yeah. Sometimes I teach the fellows that mm -hmm. if there's an eccentric entry into a malapose stent, that a stiffer balloon is more likely to damage the front edge yeah. than a less stiff balloon. And of course, you're, you know, it's not aggressive post dilation. You're you're looking at opposition. Mm -hmm. So I I think sometimes the, the semi compliant balloons yeah. are preferable. Uh, and yeah. I, I would actually like a semi compliant a five o, five five and six for the left main work. Or well, even a four o uh, column. But, but once you get to that size, it's all non compliant balloons. Yes. And if you're trying to oppose a stent in the left main, you don't need high pressure to do that. You just need the balloon to be the right size and conform. So, and, and actually, it's the inverse because, as we've seen already, you quite often o. you're proximal to the stent, so you're actually you, o, you're, you have to be proximal to the stent to yeah. oppose the, yeah. the front edge. So you actually want to do that with as low a pressure yeah. as possible. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I just don't want to I agree. Yeah. All right, guys. So we're just going to cap this thing off with a little drug looting stent here. Hey, Brian, can you see what's going on? Good. Can you see what he needs? All right, Flora, okay. A little ischemic, a little, little odd there. Just wanting to get some, some oddities. All right, so you can see I'm inside the stent here, so I'm gonna withdraw my guide extension just in the left main. I'm going to bring my stent back and uh, dry any here. All right. Looks like I've got a few. Now, what we're going to do, Flair here, come back a little bit more, huh? All right. Dry any here. All right. How's everybody feel about that? Can we go up to 25 and mag in? I think you need to see a caudal view there. Yeah, check we're going to check this, the distal edge, and then come caudal. Back yeah, to that side. You are not touching the left man. Exactly. I love it, guys. Yeah, go to spider, please. Yeah. Just make sure where we are. Bring this guide extension back just a skosh there. Bah, bah, bah. So, just to remind ourselves what our. Oh, yeah. Okay. Looks like here. Flare here. Center us up there just so we can all see. We'll do a little angio here just to make sure. Measure once, measure twice before you cut. All right, Cindy here would die. All right. How's everybody feel? It's quite difficult to tell, isn't Good. it, where the, where the stent stops, isn't it? Mm hmm. Almost, you're a bit your best place, maybe. Robert, to call that. We, we can't see. Yeah. Yeah. Let me come maybe to an AP caudal and see what that looks like. Come to AP caudal, please. See if we can line this up a bit more. Still see the ostium of the LED, but then see the distal edge. Let's see here. There you maybe go. Shoot through the guide and take the guide extension back yeah. at this point. What's this? Flora? All right. Cine here with contrast. All right. I think I come back a bit, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Flora here. Again, this really sort of the stand push, the clear mm -hmm. stands have their feel here. advantage that uh, nice of a specific land more with a contrast, a side branch That's, or something that you're aiming for. How does everybody feel about that? I think that looks better. Keeps, okay. keeps mm -hmm. me, keeps me yeah, from I that other, okay. you know what I mean? Yep. Let's go ahead and grab this. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I just want to stay away from that sort of uh, ramus -y yep. first eye. Very wise. And down. Looks good. Take that NC balloon back in. Uh, and again, this is a key uh, area, Jerry, when you've got a guide extension and you've just, you know, um, deployed the stent. That guide extension can be both, you know, of great help and also of great hazard if you're not careful with the front edge of the stent. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely true. Yeah, absolutely yeah, true. Are. The other point, which is, I think, uh, underestimated, is the time of inflation. So when you deploy a stent, Flare. five seconds is not enough to have a full deployment of the stent. So if you increase to uh, uh, 30 seconds, you will increase the size of the stent just by time. Okay. 
Oh. Yeah, I think it's a very good point, but uh, Robert's a CTO guy and that's not within his DNA. Yeah, no, I, I, used to, I, I used to get them up longer until uh, Simon came to town and we yeah. were doing some cases and we would leave them up, you know, longer than five seconds. He said, I just can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> it would, uh, I mean, I always think that the longest minute of your life is a drug looting balloon being effect. up for a minute. Oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> to go and find sure. something to do. Sure. <laughs> Sadly, I'm is not that... sure people stateside will be able to do that. But I think there is good we'll data that more yeah. prolonged inflation with the yeah. NC balloon and you're going yeah. to get better standards. So yeah, I think no, it's something no, that should be. One of my old colleagues from Edinburgh is for on 44 seconds. Exactly. Exactly. 44. 42. Seconds. No good. Okay. No good. 44 was a no world good. of difference. Flair here. Mm. That's too good. Mm. Too good. But you see, this case very tough case, but in complete control at all, all steps and uh, algorithmic right. thinking, working systematically through it. Go ahead, how going up here, please. You know, you turn a complex case into a very predictable, safe case. Mm -hmm. But it was a tough case for Robert. For it wasn't not for Cherry though. Okay. <laughs> now it's going up to twelve. <laughs> So good. Uh, there, there was very nice uh, studies about uh, kissing by inflation, uh, uh, looking at the time and the result. And uh, the, clearly, uh, it's better to inflate for 45 seconds and 10, and or three times 15 seconds. And it's clearly better in terms of uh, final result when you do kiss. But in okay. this case, there is no kissing by inflation. So what do you guys think? You see, what do you want to do now? Uh, well, I think you need to do an OCT, don't you? Mm -hmm. But OCT and OCT. I, I think you're all in or you're all out with, with, with this OCT. kind of meticulous approach that you know, Terry oh, no. and we've advocated over the years. That if you're going to say images is important because you're going to change your behaviour, then you can't ignore data that shows that you, longer, longer inflation get, results get in better stand again. expansion. Because you're impatient, you know. Because you're impatient. Mm -hmm. It's not about you, no, is exactly. it? Exactly. So uh, I think you're right. It's something we have to uh, mm -hmm. start doing. We can get OCT. the fellows to do the inflations. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, then never mind. I'll just take the OCT catheter. In my experience, the only way to make something happen in the lab is to empower the nurses. Yeah. Isn't that right? Isn't that true? All right, so let's bring our OCT catheter in. Yeah, we, we, we need to see the OCT on screen. Robert, we're just seeing the angiogram at the moment. That, uh, so you can see some SD elevation going on there as well. Uh, that's kind of been that way. That's been his baseline bundle. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You caught me for the second there too. <laughs> yeah. Got me for a second too. It's always fun when they sit down on the table and that's their baseline I know. sort of EKG. You're like, oh, that's, that's going to be fun for me. Yeah. Was that the consent process? For, <laughs> yeah. So ho hopefully we should be in a happy place here. If uh, just to check the front stand edge, you're almost your distal stand edge is kind of you, know, you don't really need to yeah. double check that. You could, you oh. know, do a high resolution shorter run, couldn't you? Yeah, I'm actually just going to put it in the middle of the stent if you yeah. guys are good. Yeah, that makes just sense. To make sure. Let me just check and make sure I'm engaged well, Flirt. It's really funny. The guy's actually been in quite well. I continue to get a bunch of swirl, which has kind of been a little disappointing. Yeah, but you're not getting good. Yeah, right, there we go. Oh, yeah. uh, with the clearance. How, how's our clearance there, Tim? Yeah, looks all right. Oh, wonderful. All right, and Cindy? Looks okay. Okay, good. Okay, the clearance cool. there, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Looks pretty good there. Yeah. Yeah. Happy with that. Guy just got a bit soft and has been just hanging out the ostium. It's a bit of pain. It's fine. Mm hmm. It's a lot cleaner oh, looking, looking isn't it? Yeah. A lot cleaner. That guide extension actually hurt us a little bit, I think, in that regard. You can almost Look see where the dissection was yeah. there as well, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. It's looking pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Front strut's just okay. Right, just right there at the front strut. I would almost take the stent appositions software yeah, off exactly. there because they're, I think you're, off. you're picking up yeah. some blood swirl. Yeah. And yeah. I think this looks pretty good, guys. Yeah. Yeah, Is everybody comfortable? Looks very good, yeah. yeah take the render stent off for a second. Just let's see the front end. Here, I think that's blood swirl at the bottom, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's a little swirl at the bottom. Yeah. I think I might be comfortable with this. What's our MSA now, Tim? 
ginormous. 8.98. We've got an 8.98. Yeah. So is everybody good or what does everybody think? No, it looks great. No, it looks very good, very good. Rob. And I think what's been interesting from our side is, is, is the escalation, the rapid escalation through a number of would have been fairly tricky points in the procedure. The, Difficult to cross the lesion with balloons, uh, a move to Before rotational atherectomy, the guide extension to help with you know contrast clearance and and, and stent delivery, and you know the the, the real detail the on J. the proximal edge and the the proximal optimization. So it's been great, Rob. I have to tell you, you know, case like this a couple months ago, it's a bigger, it's a much bigger deal. You know, to be talking to somebody with such a low EF about rota and all these things, loss of diags, all these things, mm. to be able to have the technology to make this safe, efficient, quick like this for a patient like this, to be able to go home same day, you yeah. know, is is just it's it's life changing for patients. It's practice changing for us. And so, I really just want to thank you guys so much for having us today. Thank you guys so much for your commentary, your expert sort of clinical decision making skills. Thank you to the staff, Shockwave, everybody, Optima. This has really been lovely. Yeah, I think the image we'll all take home, Robert, uh, is that pre and post IVL image and, and that focal calcific, which is basically looked like it was time to put in the stents and, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and go home. So listen, thanks to you and the team. Always pleasure to have you on board. Big thanks to have Cherry's expert uh, mm -hmm. influence online and great to hear his thoughts on bifurcations. He really has taught the world how to do bifurcations. Unbelievable. So, yeah. So a, a big thanks as well to everyone at the Christ Hospital, and we look forward to meeting you and the team again soon. Absolutely. Thank you guys again. Good. Great job, guys. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, guys. See you. Bye. So I really enjoyed that uh, case from the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, and we've heard, learned a lot about you know treatment of calcific bifurcation disease. And if we really want to drill down this topic, I can think of no one better than Thierry Lefebvre, who's really taught the world how to do bifurcations. So it's a pleasure to introduce Cherry, who's going to talk to us on the optimal treatment of bifurcations. Over to you, Thierry. Thank you very much, James. Uh, it's, uh, the pleasure is for me and uh, the honor also. So I will try in a few slides to uh, summary the, the problem of bifurcation lesions, especially in, uh, when the, there is uh, calcification. So what is optimal in the treatment of bifurcation lesions? Uh, I think it's very important to have a strategy at the very beginning of the procedure. And this strategy should be uh, flexible because sometimes you have surprise and you have to adapt. Uh, you need to have a, a stent which is well opposed and well deployed. And we have seen a good example in the, the case uh, uh, from Cincinnati today. Respect the fractal law is also very important not only in terms of acute procedural success, but also in terms of long-term outcome. Preservation of the side branch, and we have discussed about that during the session. Uh, and starting with a provisional approach. So one stent, if you can treat the bifurcation in one, is better than two. But of course, if you need two stents to treat correctly the bifurcation, you have to do it with two stents. And uh, limiting the... Uh, the overlap, uh, I think it's very important too, uh, especially if you have to use two stents, uh, you have to minimize uh, overlap uh, as a maximum. Of course, uh, stent well opposed and well deployed is, uh, is very important and uh, intuitively you understand that if you have other expansion of the stent, you will increase the risk of restenosis at uh, relatively a short term follow up, but you increase also the risk of thrombosis, which will occur uh, even uh, late. Uh, why? Uh, of course, uh, because uh, uh, the, there is a lot of mechanism for stent under expansion. It should be re it could be related to uh, lesion related factors like uh, calcification, the vessel size, the plaque volume, the plaque composition. But it can also be a technical problem or operator related factors like uh, undersized balloon. Uh, low balloon pressure, uh, duration of inflation, and we have discussed about that, i show you some data, and stent fracture, which may occur uh, not uh, in the acute phase, but at uh, longer term follow-up. Uh, I think uh, uh, we have now a lot of data, and this is an example from uh, Francesco Prati showing that uh, uh, if you do OCT at the end of the procedure and look at uh, uh, the uh, OCT findings, uh, you can see that uh, 
if you have suboptimal stenting by UCT, you increase uh, the risk of uh, event that follow up. And this occurs in uh, uh, one third of the cases. So I think it's very important to have that in mind. Uh, how to have a good, uh, uh, well opposed and well deployed stent? I think prevention is very important. So knowing the situation at risk, we know that, for example, all patients have more calcification. Uh, optimal preparation, and we have a gradation of non-compliant balloon, high pressure balloon, rotablator, and shock wave technology can be also very important. Uh, Meticulous sizing and stenting, so selecting the correct size of the stent according to what you will do during the procedure, especially bifurcation. And cure, because of course you may need to do post dilatation, you, you have to do proximal optimization technique when you do use, uh, uh, you treat bifurcation lesions. Uh, distal optimization technique are also sometimes very important, and uh, uh, it was done also in the case today. Kissing by inflation, and sometimes you may need after uh, stenting high pressure balloon or shock wave. Uh, so, lesion preparation is crucial when there is calcification. I think it's uh, very simple to understand. Uh, stent enhancement gives you a lot of information during the, the pre-dilatation because you, you will see more the calcification and the amount of calcification uh, that you have. Uh, optimal pre-dilatation of the main branch is a must, so of course it's very important, and in the case today, they, are, they have used uh, shockwave technology to have a good uh, opening of the, this calcified lesion. Time is our friend, and I will show you uh, uh, the data that we have. And of course, intracoronal amnesia is very helpful, and we have, good, uh, we have seen the, during the case a lot of good illustrations. So this is a study that we have done in my lab many years ago. And uh, we used stent enhancement to measure the size of the stent at five seconds during the same inflation, 15 seconds and 25 seconds. And you can see that uh, the minimal diameter increase clearly, and uh, the stent expansion uh, increase also uh, up to 0.9. Uh, but you can see that at five seconds it's 0.85 in this kind of example. So it means there is a big difference in terms of uh, uh, stent uh, uh, expansion when you use just time with the same pressure inflation. Uh, we have also very interesting data from Dr. Kukuli showing that uh, if you predilate with a non-compliant balloon, you will have at the end better expansion than if you use a semi-compliant balloon for predilatation. So in my lab, we, in the majority of cases, we start with non-compliant balloon just to predilate whatever the lesion. Uh, let's see an example. I think uh, it's uh, very interesting to see this uh, really unusual case. Uh, a patient, 68 years old, with diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, is an active smoker. He, had, uh, he was admitted in an other hospital for recent cardiac failure with ejection fraction by echo of 47%. But uh, uh, again, nine, nine years old, nine years ago, he had a pneumonectomy for cancer, and you will see that uh, this had a very important consequences. Uh, renal function is not perfect, and coronary angiogram was done in uh, another center. So you can see that there is a trifurcation with a CERC, intermediate branch, and LAD, with a tight stenosis of the proximal uh, CERC, but also this lesion is uh, involving also the left man and proximal LED, and you can see that the orientation of the art is not uh, usual. So there is a really a, a special orientation of the art. This is another view showing that uh, this uh, uh, left man lesion is very, very tight up to the bifurcation. So we have a kind of trifurcation with a lesion which is more one uh, zero zero one lesion but some involvement of the LED and intermediate branch. This is a, a last view showing the traf trafication of this uh, left main. So now if you look at the right, there is also a disease of the right and proximal disease uh, from the ostium up to this uh, small branch with a very tight stenosis at this level. So the patient was discussed in the other center and it, it was, uh, uh, the patient was sent uh, to our hospital, to the surgeons to do uh, uh, cabbage. 
Uh, after two hours of uh, uh, trying to treat the patient, the surgeon uh, called me and he said, I, I tried to cabbage, uh, to grab the LED of this patient. And uh, despite costal resection, due to the anatomy of the heart, I was uh, not able to do the grafting. And this surgeon is uh, the best surgeon that we have in the in hospital. So he, uh, he came with uh, the angiogram. I see the angiogram and said, OK, we, we can do something to this patient. So of course, we uh, decide to treat first uh, the, the right uh, with a non-compliant balloon. We have deployed a, a 3 stent, which was point dilate with a non-compliant balloon at 3.5 at 20 atmosphere. And this is uh, uh, the final result. Now this is the left, and you can see uh, this very tight stenosis of the left man. Uh, and the major involvement of the left man and the proximal part of the cirque. So we have wired the three branches, LED, intermediate branch, and cirque. And because of the calcification, because of the previous irradiation of the patient due to the uh, pulmonary cancer, uh, we decide to use uh, shockwave technology to, to prepare this lesion. Uh, so we have used a, a, a shockwave balloon, 3.0, at 3.5. You see the waste of the balloon on the balloon at the very beginning of the procedure. And we have done uh, uh, 80 pulses uh, on the left man and uh, cirque. Then we uh, decide to stand from the left man to the cirque because the lesion was, uh, as I said, 1001. Zero, zero, one. And uh, you, we use a, a 48 stent, 3.5, and the stent was uh, deployed at uh, relatively low pressure. Then we have done post dilatation uh, with a proximal optimization technique with a 5.0, which was the size that we have calculated according to uh, uh, the three uh, uh, diameters uh, distal to the bifurcation. This is the result of the proximal optimization uh, technique. So you can see that we have already a good result. Of course, we are not engaging the, the guiding catheter because there is two wires which are outside of the stent, so just not to do longitudinal compression. After that, we exchange wires. Uh, we went through the uh, LED. We have uh, uh, even three wires, one in the circ, intermediate, and LED. And then we use uh, stent enhancement to position the stent really at the ostium of the, the LED. The LED was big, so we used a 3.523, and uh, uh, we have done after that exchanging wires, uh, done the, uh, what we call a tracing balloon inflation with uh, one 3.5 in the LED, 3.0 in the circ, and 2.5 in the intermediate branch. Then we have redone uh, proximal optimization technique, and this is uh, a final result, which I think was uh, really uh, very acceptable, thanks to a good predilatation with uh, shockwave technology. So, of course, uh, when we tre treat bifurcation lesion, it's very important to respect the fractal law. So, when you have done the optimal main branch preparation, you stand the size, the, the, you size the stent according to the distal reference in order to avoid carina shifting. Then you do proximal optimization technique. Uh, and this is uh, very important uh, to do it optimally in order to, to be able to rewire through the stent thread uh, the other branches. And access the distal thread in order to, optima to obtain an optimal side branch ostium scaffolding uh, with the main branch stent. And then decrease the need for side branch stenting. So by respecting the fractal law, and this is a good example of the two diameter, the main branch proximal, the main branch distal, and the side branch. If you use a stent which is too big, and you, stand the, you use a stent according to proximal reference, uh, by deploying the stent, you will push the carina and close the side branch or pinch the side branch. So this is very important to follow these simple rules of respecting the fractal law. Then after doing that, uh, you do proximal optimization technique, and you try to access the distal strut. And this is uh, what you can obtain when you 
access a distal strut, you have a very nice scaffolding of the main branch proximal and distal to the bifurcation, and very nice opening and scaffolding also of the side branch ostium. And this is, of course, if you don't do proximal optimization technique and do, do, do not open the side branch uh, at the, dist uh, the level of distal strut. And of course, you, you may have a risk of restenosis just simple due to uh, neocolonization of the struts at follow -up. This is a nice illustration from my friend Olivier Darmon, who showed the difference when you don't do pot and when you do pot. So if you do pot, you have a nice a position of the stent proximal to the carina. And of course, you enlarge the stent strut, so you facilitate access toward the distal strut uh, when you go through the, through the side branch. This is the data from uh, uh, the e ultimaster registry, which I think is very are very important because uh, it's a registry, but they look at the role of pot and no pot. And you can see that uh, uh, if you do proximal optimization technique uh, uh, with a one stand technique, you decrease the risk of cardiac death, tangled vessel MI, uh, stent thrombosis, so 0% versus 1.1. But in this study, POT was only done in one third of the cases. So very low, uh, low rate of proximal optimization technique. So it's underused. Uh, now this is data from uh, uh, the same registry when you have used two stents. And again, you can see that uh, proximal optimization technique is only used in 42% of cases. So very uh, low rate of proximal optimization technique, despite the fact that, again, you have less event when you do proximal optimization technique as compared to no proximal optimization technique. Side branch preservation, uh, we have also discussed during the live case about that. I think it's very important to protect all the side branches that you do not want to lose during the procedure. Uh, respect the fractal law to avoid closing the side branch just by pinching uh, the carina toward the side branch. Open the strut toward the side branch that may be treated in the future. So for example, left man, uh, when you do a crossover from left man to LED and you do not open the strut toward the circ, I think it's very important to do that uh, for the future if you have to access uh, in the in the circ. Uh, and you may also have uh, uh, restenosis, a pseudo restenosis due to neocolonization of the strut by the neonatelium. Uh, Use a non-compliant balloon in the side branch, decrease the need for side branch stenting. So we always do the kiss with a non-compliant balloon in the side branch when we do provisional side branch stenting. Uh, and of course, stent relevant side branch in case of potential residual ischemia. So this is what was done during the case today. So the diagonal was a second one, uh, probably not really relevant in terms of potential residual ischemia at follow up. And of course, maintain the carina in the center of the vessel. I think it's very important for uh, decreasing the risk of a future event. And finally, it's very important to have a bifurcation strategy, as I said at the very beginning of this uh, lecture. So it really depends on the risk of side branch occlusion. So if you have a low risk of side branch occlusion, I think the provisional side branch stenting approach is the best uh, approach. Uh, of course, you can end the procedure with just provisional, or you can end with a T or T or protrusion, T and protrusion, or even a culotte if you like to do a culotte. But on the opposite, if you have a high risk of side branch occlusion, of course, you have two options. One is to do a Dika crush technique, uh, which is very popular in some countries, uh, but you can do also inverted provisional. So going from the main branch to the side branch with the main branch tent, and then you have possibility of doing inverted T, inverted tap, or inverted culotte. So I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I hope that you have, will have a, a very good uh, day today. Thank you. Jerry, that was a great talk. Really enjoyed it. What I'm kind of getting that the kind of perception, Jerry, is that we're starting to understand in some detail the, the mechanistic properties of a bifurcation, how we reconstruct it with stents, and how that affects outcomes. And, and, and our understanding has increased quite a lot with this you know, data over the last 10 to 15 years. 
but we're still seeing, when we look at registries, a real divergence between what the data tells us and what people are doing. So how do we address that problem? Uh, it's a difficult question, James. <laughs> uh, I think we, uh, we have to show data uh, showing that uh, provisional, for example, provisional approach is a good approach. And you don't, you don't have to stand everything uh, to have a good uh, long-term outcome. Um, and maybe you will see at the next uh, EuroPCR the data from uh, EBC men uh, study about left men comparing uh, provisional uh, versus two stand, systematic two-stand approach. Uh, I think it will be interesting to see this, uh, this data as compared to the Deca Crush 5 that you know showed that uh, uh, peak accrush was better than provisional. But of course, it's a subject of uh, controversy because uh, in Deca Crush 5, they, are, they, are, they were treating very complex lesion with a long side branch lesion, uh, longer than 15 millimeter in length. So, Thierry, let me also broaden the conversation to bring in column because when I see these um, studies, DK crush versus other techniques versus one stent or two other types of two stent. The elephant in the room is that we're comparing apples with oranges. And there really isn't any understanding of the role of the operator or experience or even imaging. We all look at all these elements as if they exist in isolation column, whereas we know in a case you, you, you can't say, I'm, you know, I'm going to do DK crush, but I'm not going to image, for example. Well, or use physiology. Well, exactly, and you, and you saw in the registries what the proximal optimization, which you would, uh, you know, assume to be a very basic step in bifurcation, was done in what a third of cases. So, I think you're right. I think the classification is still too complex. You saw the slide, how many different types of bifurcation strategies they are. And I wonder, do we need to sort of declutter that and make it more simple uh, and have clear three or four strategies which, which you apply uh, and then set about doing those in a, in a rigorous fashion? In terms of, you know, I would favour clot, you would favour clot. So if you were to do a DK crush, you'd probably do a clot better because you're doing that all mm. day, every day or most days. So mm. that operator preference and that operator experience is very hard to tease out in, in the trials. Yeah. And, and you're doing a, a large volume of cases, as is Terry. So it, it can be quite hard that if somebody's not doing it very often and then they're doing a certain technique which they're not familiar with, the results are going to be affected by that. And actually, what we're saying a lot of the times, Jerry, is actually the role of behavioral factors is something which we never really understand or examine or look at. And the reason we're scratching ahead around proximal optimization is that it's easy. And most of the time, behavior is driven down gradients. You know, if something's easy, people will do it. If something's hard, they won't do it. And actually, as you say, Colin, perhaps what we need to do is make things easier full stop, give people less options, Cherry, rather than more options. What do you think about that? Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, I think we, uh, uh, we have to continue to work in this field uh, to, uh, to explain and simplify the approaches. Uh, in, my, in my center, it's relatively simple because we always do provisional. Uh, of course, in 85% uh, of cases, we'll end with just one stent. And in 15% of cases, we'll end with two stents, and the majority of cases will be T and or TAP. So it's very simple. Uh, of course, some people prefer to do culotte. I think uh, it's also a nice approach because it's a kind of double provisional. So you do, you stand the main branch or the side branch, then you do pot, then you access the other branch, uh, you stand and you do another pot and final kissing by inflation. Uh, I think. Uh, Experience is also something very important. And I, uh, I really believe that uh, sharing experience with a younger internationalist is very important. Uh, we have seen, for example, in the data from Kinnerd about left men, that the impact of experience in terms of outcome is huge. So if you do uh, more than uh, 40 left men cases a year, you have clearly better results than if you do only three cases a year. But if you do it, if you are doing a few cases, but you are doing it with uh, 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 somebody who is very experienced, you, you will learn a lot. And of course, doing images when you are in the learning phase, it's also something which is, I think, very important.
Yeah, and it sometimes amuses me, Colin and Thierry, when we talk about the impact of experience like it's some sort of surprise. Like if we do something more frequently, we'll get better at it. I mean, if somebody was a tennis player or a golfer or a footballer, well, they have to train to get better, obviously. And the more they train, the better they get. So why we don't think that principle applies to interventional cardiology is baffling. And, and you know, <coughs> part of the UK data set was within centres, the difference between centres, the FUI data, which was the same within the same centre, the high volume operators had much better outcome for left main intervention than mm -hmm. the low volume operators. So it, it's very consistent data. It just seems to be something that we struggle to, to, to face and, and, and to deal with. But um, I sort of just can't help but think if we had a, a provisional strategy which if you then have to put in the second stent becomes the T and protrusion that Terry mentions. And then if you're going for a two stent, it's either a culotte or a double kiss crush. And an operator preference can come into that, but those should be really the four main strategies. And, and, and you know, you can have a sort of an umbrella within that, but simplifying the techniques and clarifying then the different steps within the techniques. And here's a rather controversial thought. The, the reason why I think we get such variance in practice is probably cultural. We have this focus on the individual where we think the individual is more important than the collective. And that that cultural oversight doesn't apply to China, where it's a much more, oh, yeah. the, you know, the, the, the whole it's population is more important than an individual. Mm -hmm. So they have a network solution to bifurcations. We're going to do DK crush yep. and we're going to do a lot of it. And the people are going to do it, are going to do it till they and get really good at it. Yep. And that results in better outcomes for patients, whereas we talk endlessly about what single operators do. And actually, the, the patient level perspective is almost lost in that. We also talk a lot about the bifurcations, you know, but, you know, and the different types and the different strategies, but it's going to be a single stent or it's going to be a two stent. And then if it's two stent, is it going to be a culotte or a form of a crush? You know, and it just has to be as basic as that. Uh, and then working through the steps, I think. Yeah, so, so Terry, it's almost like going into a shop where there's too many choices and you're thinking, well, that's, what do I do here? We should be aiming for something much more simple, much easier to employ. And probably for the complex lesions, we should be saying for each centre should only have two or three operators, depending on volume, who should be specialised in that. Do you think we, we need to go that far? I think it's like CTOs. In fact, uh, when you have done more than 50, uh, where you are doing more than 50 CTOs a year, you are becoming a very good operator after a few years. So the same for bifurcation and left main, and the same for all uh, PCI uh, procedures. Uh, so I think uh, it's very important to have a, a big volume of procedures when you are at least in the learning phase, and uh, and to share experience with others. Uh, so we, we do that every day in my lab. So uh, when we have a complex case, uh, we are discussing the case. Uh, during the procedure, if you have some hesitation, something which is not clear, we ask another guy who, who is working in the other room, etc. So I think sharing experience is really uh, crucial. And as you said, uh, decreasing the number of strategies uh, is also something very important. So you, you have to, to uh, we need to have something very simple that you know how to do it. So in, in China, it's a DK crush for two stand techniques. In my lab, it's a T or TAP. Uh, in some other labs, it's a culotte. Uh, so learn how to do it well, and then you, you, you will have good outcome. Yeah, and I think that collaborative approach and that sharing of education, of course, is what this whole Calcium Masterclass is predicated on. So. Final Thank question, you. Cherry, and again, thank you for your great talk and your expertise as always. So do you think uh, IVL is, a, is, a, is an additional benefit within bifurcation bifurcations, or do you think it's just another new toy that we need to understand where it fits in? No, I think it's, it's very useful. Uh, we have seen that in, uh, in the case today, it, uh, it simplified the procedure. And this is what I think. The, the case that I presented was also a very complex case uh, after a failed uh, cabbage, and uh, it simplified the procedure. So it's really a, a tool. It is very easy to use uh, and uh, really uh, uh, modify the, the calcium in order to have good expansion of the stand and decrease the risk of complication. I mean, simple is always better, but attention to detail never goes out of fashion. So listen, thanks again, Cherry. Yeah. Thanks, Colm.
We look Thank forward you. to meeting up with you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Please join me and Jonathan Hill for Class 8, Clinical Evidence and Algorithms. Jonathan will be talking on the CAD3 data. Matthew Price will be asking, what's the plan as we get to grips with the role of algorithms? Benjamin Anton will be reviewing IVL data to date and asking, where are the gaps? And finally, Asok Sheth will be telling us about the Indian experience. Look forward to seeing you there. Goodbye for now.